Well, hi there, everybody. This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, wishing you season's greetings. And, as usual, we're working from life today on a program that's devoted to working from life, namely setups that are brought in specifically for the occasion, and working in oils on canvas. So, uh, as usual, I'm sitting here at the easel. I do not work standing up. I find that it's... Uh, it is far better to instruct sitting down because a lot of people cannot stand. So my business of sitting at the easel is to accommodate uh, everyone who has the, the desire to paint. You do not have to stand. All right, I brought in a composition which is seasonal, but it's a kind of an antidote to the, the red and green syndrome that we have been living with since Halloween, uh, because as soon as somebody says Christmas is coming, everything red and green comes out. And I kind of, uh, I love red and green, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, somehow to get away from it a little bit is rather exciting if you can get excited over pastel colors, and there they are. Remarkable. I'm going to tell you about those, uh, those ornaments and where they're made and how they came about and how come America has them, because this story of them is on the box in which they come. Let me start with my canvas here. Uh, my, I have tinted the canvas very dark for transmission purposes, and I'm going to therefore draw this in white ink, uh, which is nothing more than turpentine, which has been reduced uh, with some white in it. Um, I'm going to put the vertical line to give, you the, uh, 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 to give you the way you lay out something which stands, because it must be vertical. If it's not got a vertical center line, it's going to be all askew. Therefore, uh, lay the, it will, of course, be painted over, but the vertical line is your guideline of how to go about uh, setting these things up. If you cannot draw, do not attempt to, to put paint on a canvas until you learn how to draw what you're going to be doing, because it's, um, it's like trying to plan anything. If you don't have a plan, it's not going to succeed. And planning is the, is, the, is the whole point of laying out a composition. Now the center line is giving me an idea of where the middle of everything goes. Therefore, the problem is, is solved pretty much in the beginning by having this guideline. And the other one is that if you don't draw this object properly, uh, you know, people are not going to understand wh what it is. So uh, whether it's something as simple as this object, and I'll tell you about that in just a second, um, the... Um, uh, it's the business of being a realistic painter. If you are realistic, uh, there is no problem about recognizing what it is. Uh, the dreaded question, of course, is uh, what's that supposed to be? And that's something that, that I avoid uh, ever having anybody ask me by being faithful and true to the subject matter which I have set up in front of me. This is the general feeling of that particular um, object. And the symbol on it, and as long as you've got the view of it so nicely uninterrupted, the symbol of the, the, is a Chinese symbol for the word joy. And that's kind of whimsical, I think, seeing as how that is, in fact, a dishwasher detergent joy bottle, which I painted. Uh, the, other, the other theory about that is that if you're going to handle something every day of your life, uh, make it attractive. Uh, do not handle ugly things. Uh, it kind of gets into your psyche. So here at this appropriate season, I am uh, I'm laying out this, uh, just, just to show you how to lay it out, uh, this little Chinese symbol does, uh, denoting joy. Uh, my sense of humor sometimes is uh, maybe a little bit far out, but I think this one is pretty comprehensible. And uh, I take all sorts of other things and decorate them. I'll do a program about that some other time, of how to take ordinary objects and decorate them for your own personal use and, and or pleasure. All right, I'm going, to lay, I'm going to lay these out, and they will be my points of reference. This is approximately in this position at the bottom of this bottle, and the one next to it intersects it, therefore it is going to be laid out in front of it. And the, um, these, um, 
These ornaments are available to everyone. I happen to find them. I had never seen these uh, pastel colored ornaments until this year. I don't know if they're new, if they are, uh, bless them all. Uh, they are made in America, but they originally, uh, the company that makes these, uh, uh, originally came from Germany, where they began to learn how to blow glass uh, equally as well as the Venetians, who are famous for their blown glass. And um, this is the Kreb family. Uh, it began a very long time ago in Germany, and as America has uh, played host to many, many millions of people, they played host to the Krebs family that came over here and they are now manufacturing these things. Still Krebs, still the Krebs people, K-R-E-B. They're still manufacturing these, only it's out in the West. I believe they're in Arizona. And so I always think that it's interesting to find these, these uh, objects that uh, originated elsewhere and that we have man latched onto and found, uh, and found indispensable. This is the little peach colored one. I'm kind of crowding the composition so that it so that it fits into this rectangle, which is the size of my canvas. But it also means to show you that you can, in fact, play a little bit with the, um, with the layout of objects if, in order to make it more appealing. Um, the composition of a painting, unbeknownst to many people who look at paintings, um, is, is very important. And if it's not thought about as before you begin to paint, you'll find yourself with a bad composition. And many people don't know why the painting doesn't work. Most of the time, it's because of the composition. So I have here uh, six uh, objects of exactly the same size. And I have to make sure that I can make it interesting. Uh, if they're all exactly the same size, it looks like the size, it looks like a display in a window, like the five and 10, selling uh, the m millions of objects, all the same shape and all the same size. So you try to make it interesting. This, the negative space, which is back here, is going to be left completely by itself. Uh, uh, more than likely for talking about later, if you ever wanted to, if I ever wanted to add uh, something else in the background here, then it would become a fantasy because I have, in, as the background, just the scene or the set, uh, the flat here in the studio. Therefore, I'm going to leave it completely alone, maybe have time to talk about uh, doing a fantasy background on this because either because of the season or because the composition would call for it. All right, we have these wonderful colors. Let me, let me just work up the colors first. Uh, and I'm working with what I call pretty glamorous and funky tones here. Uh, it, one of them is called Geranium Lake, wherever they came up with that one, but that's the pink. And the pink is, uh, is rather remarkable. I'm using a, uh, a brand new acrylic brush. It is a brush made for acrylic paints, but I have found through experiment that they work extremely well on, uh, on, these, uh, on these oils, especially on prepared canvas. So I have here the beginning of this, and, you, and, and it's all going to be a formula. Every one of these is going to be done in the, uh, more than likely in the same way, because the lighting is all overhead. It is a, um, it's a harsh studio lighting, which is, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's nothing to condemn it, but it's more than likely not the kind of lighting that anybody would have in their own home. So understand that the, the harshness is what makes these very pale pastel uh, ornaments uh, as dark as they are. Uh, as you can see on the monitor, that tends to be the, the darkest thing on the entire canvas is this pale pink ornament here with an extremely dark shadow. Uh, there is also a shadow coming from the cloth and all of these things are to be pointed out uh, because I find that maybe seeing things, but people need to be uh, shown what they're seeing, uh, which is, could be a contradiction in terms, except that that's more than likely exactly what it is. A lot of people see things and uh, do not decipher them. Uh, nothing wrong with their eyesight, it's just training uh, to decipher something and to understand what it is that you're looking at. So we have here, um, I have here the highlight, uh, base of, of white, of course, uh, but it's extremely pale pink because this is a pink ornament. Uh, the blending is what we're after here for this uh, particular problem, and th the blending can only be done with oils. Anybody who thinks that you can do this with the acrylics will um, experience a sorry, sad lesson and a frustrating experience. Oils are the only things that are going to be able to get you to blend um, satisfactorily for this kind of a of a uh, technique. You have to get the uh, you have to get the softness 
of the blend, uh, and that's accomplished only with this particular medium. Uh, I have I have talked about blends before, and uh, maybe one of the things that's appealing about my paintings is that I do pay attention to the blends and the subtlety of it. The danger is, of course, that this begins to look like a, a photograph. You don't want a painting to look like a photograph. It, it must have a painterly quality of some kind. Um, and that's, of course, always the great problem. And I hope that with these programs, I can give some idea of how to get a painterly look about it, but still have it absolutely uh, recognizable and have a realistic approach to the uh, rendering of these objects. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the blend is... Uh, is as smooth, I suppose, as one should uh, should hope for, but it can always be refined and get it down so that it is actually um, almost photographic in, in finish. Uh, you, uh, you cannot do this by copying a photograph. You must have the object in front of you. There is a, there is a wonderful darkness about this, too, which, uh, which, of course, is um, one of the reasons that these things are so dramatic. Uh, the darkness and the paleness and the preconceived idea that this is a very pale object is com completely blown out of the water by seeing that the shadows are extremely dark. Um, I've set this up on a piece of, of uh, uh, plum colored velvet because I didn't want to have any shine to the fabric. I just wanted the objects to shine. That is why I make these selections and talk about them because an awful lot of times, people who are attempting to paint themselves uh, find it find trouble so making selections of what to paint. Uh, you've seen this program often enough to know that I paint sometimes onions and sometimes something as homely as a as an eggplant or black plums and so on. And uh, the reason for that is because I have trained myself to make interesting selections. Uh, I think I'm going to get really dark with this and try and make the point. I'm going to be using uh, spectrum. Um, a violet, uh, and it's actually one of the darkest tones that you can use. I use it many times as a substitute for black. The, uh, the darkness of these is what's going to make the balls very shiny, uh, because there is no light without darkness. And we learned that during the, uh, during the wars, when a cigarette uh, could be seen from uh, 60,000 feet in an airplane if it was in a black, dark night. Uh, so it's always interesting to be able to make the statement that without darkness, there is no light. Uh, this is pretty much the formula for this, uh, for the painting of this object. Therefore, uh, because we are limited in time, and this is going to be only an hour's program, uh, I'm going to go on to the, uh, to the, uh, the object with the symbol. That, is, that can be treated in an extremely simple way because there are almost no highlights on it. It is, a, um, it is an object which is painted and uh, the, the, uh, the, the colors are limited and also the highlights that are almost none. There's only one on the, uh, on the, um, the edge. So uh, putting the colors in, it's almost like filling in the numbers. The, uh, the colors are, this is I'm using burnt sienna with a touch of purple in it to get a little bit of white to be able to get that uh, sort of nice uh, rich chocolatey tone. And uh, because I drew the symbol in, I'm going to leave it there so that you uh, so that I don't, um, you know, perplex you about why do I paint over it as long as I laid it out. And it also will give a sort of a, of a painterly technique to um, going around this outline and then refining it later. But the uh, the need to just put the colors in very simply here is uh, is the way I would render this bottle. Let me see that that sort of cuts off here. I did some research on this uh, on this symbol. Naturally, I do research on just about everything because I'm kind of a, I'm kind of, uh, well, I'm a sort of a stickler for authenticity. And if I say that this comes from the Ming Dynasty, I'm jolly well going to get it off a, uh, f the photograph in a in a in a uh, library book of a vase from that particular period. And um, this is a direct copy. The vase was not this shape, but the um, the coloring and the symbol was what it what you see. I chain I. The, adapted the uh, design to this particular shape. The shape, I don't know whether or not the people who make these bottles are aware, the shape is actually quite good. It, um, it, uh, it as you can see, I can adapt it and make it look almost, uh, the, almost like, an, uh, like something else but what it is. It, um, the little, the little um, shape at the top has got a sort of a pagoda look about it. 
and the cinched in waist is, is, is rather nice. Uh, so, uh, as I say, uh, the, um, the, uh, um, it's not exactly ugly, but there are eight million of them on the shelves, and that's what I thought that I would get away with, uh, get away from, by having one on my particular sink top that is uh, a color scheme which I like and which is not like four million others. That's the terrible part about wanting to be original all the time. You apply it even to your dishwasher detergent. So, um, you know, w whatever that's worth. Uh, anybody can steal my ideas if they want to. I have no patent on these things. And um, uh, if, if my ideas bring something good into anybody's life, then so be it. Let them, let them have it. It's, uh, it's, my, it's, it's a kind of a, well, I'm lending you the idea. You, you don't have to own it. Nobody owns an idea. But anyway, here, here are the, uh, here are the, um, here is the way that I, I render the bottle. I'm using plain uh, pure white and some yellow ochre to do the cream tone of that symbol, which, um, uh, is a is a it's, a it's a wonderfully simple symbol maybe it can become sort of a universal symbol maybe like the um, like the dove is the peace sign this can be the sign for for joy we have our own but we have three symbols namely a j a y and a, a, an o and a y here we just have a a, a handsome uh, semi geometric pattern i don't know i don't remember what this little gizmo is up here I took it off the bottle, but uh, I don't know if that's part of the uh, of the symbol or not. It probably is. I, I'm sure that if anybody who, who writes Chinese will be able to see this program, maybe they can tell me whether or not this, this has any... I'm sure it's related to the rest of it. Well, I have here now the need for to, to, to use some pure black, which is um, um, a, a color that I don't often use. I, I've always advised against black, but here black is needed. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, and uh, as you might remember from my other programs, this is a, uh, a show that goes by much too quickly. Uh, there's very little time to do what I want to do, namely uh, a lot of wonderful details, but I do refine them. And then when I refine them, I, they will go into the, um, the, uh, the show and uh, sale of these television paintings uh, come the spring, like we did last year. And I hope that everybody remembers that one because we, that was a good time. Um, the, uh, I, I laid this out improperly. The top of it is a little bit longer than it is. Therefore, uh, I'm, I'm changing as, as I go and, and may, yes, that's the way it is. This little nice pagoda shaped top here is, is very interesting to me uh, because it, uh, I didn't realize that it was pagoda shaped until I um, did this silly thing of painting this vase. Um, so let me, let me, oh, here we go. This is the way it goes, and, we'll, and I'll refine the background afterwards. But as you can see, all of this is, uh, is planned ahead uh, with a drawing, and when the time comes to apply the colors, the information has already been given to you. Uh, you uh, with oils, of course, you can apply it over, um, making sure that when you change color, you keep your brush clean. That has been a, uh, that has been a kind of a logo for me for an awfully long time keep your brushes clean. This is one of the problems with people who say, when I paint, I make a terrible mess because the colors get picked up and my brush gets full of the wrong color. So uh, besides working from life and, and drawing before you paint, uh, there is also the other, the other instructional little gift of um, be sure that your brushes are clean. Um, I, I come up from uh, from a long way to do this program, and I must tell you that coming up and finding the uh, the very cold weather, I'm I've moved to an area which is not as cold as this is here. I've moved to Virginia. We do get some good spots of cold, but. Uh, this is much cooler up here than it is down there, and I have to tell you, I love the cold weather, uh, especially at this season. There's nothing more unnatural than sitting under a palm tree, in my opinion, at Christmas time. So, uh, whether we don't like the blowing winds or not, they make a great deal of sense, especially to somebody who is used to having cold weather in the winter time. Here's another black line, and this is beginning to take shape, and. Uh, the uh, the details, of course, there are millions of little circles here. Would be done uh, in in a in a period of time when there is time to devote to that. I when I painted those little circles, I think there was a bad television program on, and I was not paying any attention, so the time went by. But uh, the little circles are part of the original design, taken from a powerfully long time ago, and therefore they were essential to put in the design. Uh, but to, to put them in this painting now, I would not subject anybody to watching me do millions of little black circles, nor 
are millions of little um, uh, scale-like things here, but that's, uh, this is what would go up here, and these are the details, and just, uh, just a small bit like pre-cooking your roast, like uh, the cooking shows do. We'll show you how you, how you would do that up there. Also, this symbol, uh, the, uh, the symbol is surrounded by a black line, which is part of the, uh, part of the cribbed design, which I took. And therefore, it, therefore, it would be essential to to be faithful to that too. So, in the end, you should be able to get a bottle that looks exactly like uh, like the one that I have um, like the one that I have shown you here. Ooh, there's another little area down at the bottom there that needs some more of this tone. So, this is the end of the bottle down here. All right, um, I'm going to proceed on to the to the next color, and it's going to be the same formula, but a few different things are going to take place, namely a reflection from the uh, from one of the ornaments onto the other one. So the green one will be the one that I'm going to tackle now. That's kind of sap green and a touch of phthalo blue, and uh, it's very very dark on one side, even though it's a very pale ornament. It's dark. And, uh, and it has some more blue in it. Pay, pay attention. Uh, I, I have to pay attention. The, uh, the uh, confusion about being faithful to these colors is because there's a preconceived idea that these are pale objects. They are pale objects, but they sure pick up very, very dark shadows. And uh, the, uh, the, the darkness is what's going to make them shine, as I said before. Here is the... Um, I think a little bit, really, a little bit of um, deep color can be introduced down here. Um, I believe that this is going to be transmitted uh, on a um, on Christmas Day, and that means that um, uh, you will uh, probably be doing a dozen other things at the same time, and maybe. Um, the uh, uh, station will rebroadcast re this for some of these details because the details of painting this kind of thing are um, sh sh should have a, a certain amount of attention on someone's part so that you can maybe use this uh, use it uh, use this lesson as a reference for other uh, projects that uh, obviously I'm going to be doing later. But what 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 I'm dealing with here is texture and blend and uh, the uh, complexity of this kind of texture and blending is what I'm dealing with now. I've been painting objects on this program for a long time and talking about highlights but um, something as um, as uh, totally unique as the uh, way the uh, re the reflections on these ornaments take place has got to do with the technique of oil painting. Um, uh, uh, very definitely a a, uh, <laughs> a problem if you're dealing in uh, realism. So uh, the the reflection of the of the other ornament, which is taking place on this green one is another interesting part. Instead of it being uh, pale green, such as the first uh, one was, it's got, a, uh, it's got a pinkish tone because the object next to it is pinkish. So uh, these are things that may or may not have been observed by, uh, by the people who are watching this program, but now that I have pointed it out, it's rather intriguing to see that the, uh, the green ball will pick up the pink reflection from the one next to it are all part of the business of, sh of, of, of pointing out what it is that you're seeing. Uh, I th I have, I've been teaching for a long time this technique of seeing of, of what you see, and uh, it, is, it is extremely um, interesting to see how enjoyable it is for people to suddenly uh, say, oh, I didn't see that before, uh, I'm glad you pointed it out. Um, I, being in this business and doing this constantly, it is no big deal for me, and it's almost as natural as breathing. But for people who are just starting out, it's uh, it's vital that somebody show them what they're seeing. Uh, there is nothing wrong with uh, with being shown what you see because. Um, you know, it's like when you take your child somewhere and say, oh, look, there, do you see that enormous red balloon? Well, of course the child sees it, but maybe he didn't. So, here is the, here is the way I would, you know, in a very quick and, and, and uh, quick manner, uh, describe to you how I would do that. But the other one <coughs> that is going to be next to it m get, makes some sense out of what I just showed you because the color of it is, is what is causing that to happen. Uh, this I'm using some orange and some red and a touch of 
a touch of white and see whether on this is the most difficult color to try to, to, to try to isolate this this kind of orangey pink one uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing but I'm gonna you know we're gonna tackle it it's also got some interesting uh, it, uh, some interesting uh, darks which are um, th this color is apparently picking up an awful lot of what there is on the velvet underneath so keeping my brush clean as usual and trying to find whatever that dark color is underneath there no nope, that's not it got to get even darker uh, and here is the here is the circle of the highlight now <clears throat> um, the um, the, the, the business of selecting this, you know, what do you do for a seasonal program that has not been done before? I think that anybody who has been uh, involved with uh, and struggling through the season of shopping has been um, blasted by every possible uh, ornament and decoration. Uh, and uh, so selecting something for a Christmas program uh, required a little bit of thought, especially that I'm so... I'm so argumentative about it that I wanted to make sure that I presented something that was uh, uh, as unique as you can get in this season where everything has been done. Uh, everything from lighting the Christmas tree in front of the White House to decorating the local uh, deli uh, has been done. And so what do you do? And I, I guess my, my answer was that I tried to take some objects that were quasi-symbolic of the season, but also maybe a, a little bit off-center. Uh, I'm hoping that that works. If this does work, if the painting works out and is, and is appealing in any way, it may not be so seasonal after all. And if it is <coughs> seasonal, then uh, you put it away until next year and then you can use it almost uh, as you use your home interior, home uh, Christmas decorations. You hang up your Christmas painting uh, every year. Uh, it sort of is guaranteed that the painting won't get hurt because uh, it won't have anything whacking against it. It'll be put away in a closet with the rest of the stuff. So the, um, the uh, need to select this was, uh, was on the agenda for quite a few weeks now. And last year, uh, if anybody remembers last year, I did a painting of, uh, of Santa Claus with a model who volunteered to sit, and we had a rather good time, and I do believe we had some children in the audience, but that's because it was... Um, it was planned a good deal ahead and we were able to do that. However, every, every year we try to come up with something that, uh, that is uh, unusual and I'm not sure that Santa Claus was painted on any other show last year and I'm not sure that uh, pastel colored Christmas balls will be seen on many programs either. And one of the things that uh, makes the, um, the planning of this program important is that when you, once you win an award, you sort of feel responsible to keep winning. I don't know why we can't just be happy with one, but um, back in the back of everybody's mind is, what can I do this time that is going to make this the best? And, uh, or at least the most unusual. And so that's why we, <coughs> that's why I selected this particular uh, object, uh, these objects. Well, I'm gonna take a break in a few minutes and uh, come back and uh, maybe work on the cloth and see if I can come up with my fantasy uh, background uh, to make it even more seasonal. So as you are contemplating this particular uh, composition, which needs a little bit of work done to it, um, I'll just take a break for a few moments. Um, don't forget to watch me in a second or so when I come back. Go about to whatever is fun today and uh, tune in soon again in a moment. Thank you.
are back again to try to conclude in the, within the next half hour uh, a painting which is kind of complex. There's no question about it. It is not easy, but <clears throat> it's not fun if it's easy. Therefore, <clears throat> you pick something that is challenging and also maybe in the end uh, rewarding. Um, I'm going to be dealing a little bit with the fabric. I, I have to do this in little sort of uh, segments so that I can get as much done as possible in the short period of time. This fabric is velvet. Uh, uh, difficult to render, difficult to understand what is happening because the, uh, because the, um, the subtleties of this particular fabric are just everywhere, everywhere you look. And so the, the best thing that I can do is to simply point out the, uh, the darks, uh, the, the um, canvas that I've done has been tinted very much the same color um, as the fabric. I did it purposely because, as I say, when, we, when you have a limited time, you have, to, you have to contemplate what it is that is going to be able to be accomplished in that limited amount of time. Accomplishing the, the painting of the color of this, of this fabric wouldn't have been possible. So I tinted, I tinted, the, um, I tinted the canvas uh, in approximately the same, uh, the same color scheme. I'm painting the shadows in, uh, pointing out to you that the shadows are going to what make this, um, this velvet look like velvet because there is a different quality to velvet with the shadows than there is for cotton or anything else. Mm, you will, if you ever do uh, have the, uh, the uh, audacity or braveness to attempt to paint velvet, um, be, be advised that it is different than any other fabric to, to, to paint. Uh, it, it doesn't come close to anything I can think of. So uh, here is this, uh, the darkness is I think going to be uh, vital to explain to you what is happening uh, because even though this is a very soft plum colored velvet, once again the shadows are extremely dark. They, um, the, and it also is due to the fact that this is in, a, is, is in a brilliantly lit studio. The chances of you are having this amount of light in your own home is, is probably absolutely minimal, if not impossible. But uh, as I say, I'm working from life in this studio. We may, we may have some new um, nice ideas coming up for the program in which we will have a different lighting effect taking place many times, at which time I'll talk about that. But right now we're talking about studio lights, which, uh, which is what make uh, the things look like they look make them look like this. So uh, all of this is, 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 um, is part of the business of talking to you about how to observe what you see and how to interpret what you see. The, um, the shadows that I'm putting in now behind here are going to be what, what anchor this little blue one to the, uh, to the uh, area in which it sits. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm using terms which may sound really dumb, but they're the best ones I can come up with right now. These Christmas balls are sitting on this fabric. And here I'm, I've, I've got to, um, and rendering this in a short period of time, is, you're going to see is gonna have to be totally simplified because we have we have uh, the need to accomplish so much. I'm dealing with the, with the texture of these, of these ornaments and also with the, with the, the manner in which they uh, cast shadows on the fabric. Speaking about the ornaments for just a moment, let me, uh, oops, my little pink one's gonna come back over that. Um, the, uh, the little crown-like, uh, the little crown-like uh, holders on these ornaments that are shaped like a little crown go back now you find this hard to believe. Go back to the uh, to the 18th century when this family in Germany began making these, and they decided that they needed a kind of an identifying mark. And their identifying mark was that they made the crowns, uh, that made the um, the, uh, the the little hanging ornaments in the shape of a crown probably for the king of Bavaria at that time. He was a pretty uh, liked guy, and they probably uh, used his design of his crown on these little, on these little, um, these little things that uh, hold the uh, balls together. Fascinating. Uh, in, to me, it's fascinating. M maybe it isn't to anybody else, but that's the way that that's what the story is. These shadows, of course, are extremely dark underneath here. They almost blend right into the green. You can barely see them. And uh, over here we have a shadow that's this hitting on that blue one, and we'll get, I'll get over to that right away. But I do want to anchor this one uh, down here that it seems to be floating on the fabric. It needs, its, it needs its shadow, and it also needs its little crown that I'm talking about. I'm going to put the little crown in after I put the shadow so that I don't have to paint around it. Uh, 
So um, before I get to the blue one, I'll put one little crown in and show you that the simpler, simplest way of, of um, of uh, rendering that is uh, with just a, a, a few very select strokes uh, over on top the on top of the um, on top of the, uh, the 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 color that I made. It, the, the little crown has got has got some nice little well shiny things. And in refining this picture, the little shiny things would be much more carefully attended to. But for the most part, this is about the way I would handle it. And then the top of it is in very deep shadow here. This is the top, and of course the little wire thing, thing with jig that sticks out, has got to be done with a very, very small brush, and I have that one right here, and it sh it, it's um, it's nothing more than a thread of color. It's um, it's it. I'm picking up a thread of color, and I'm going to put it on this way. Fortunately, uh, um, uh, we have the ability to zero in on this. And uh, the young fellow who is directing this, young Matt Garfine, is really with it every instant, which is, you know, extremely gratifying. That's what makes this show wonderful. Um, uh, thanks, Matt, uh, for showing that uh, so clearly. It was, um, it was just at the right moment. Here is the, uh, here's the little crown on the other one, and uh, that seems to be sort of askew, but it's, it, it, it comes down in its little points. Uh, and it's and it's as I say, it's it, it is the simplest possible way of of, of showing you these, but uh, that's that that's the um, that's the uh, the rapidity with which I have to work is is what dictates this. So here's that little crown. As you can see, it's not that complicated, and I'm going to do that little wire once again by running a thread of of, um, of white just over in its in it, and and the the dark background accommodates that and shows you that that very subtle little wire is um, vital to tell you what that is. What is that thing? I also notice now, as, I'm, as we're zeroing in, that there's a very sharp highlight right up here against that little crown. And it's, um, it's, it's extremely bright, but it's also blended. So I'm gonna blend this corner here. These are all details which may or may not seem important at the time, but they are to me. And then also you see the little separation of that crown by, uh, with the little points here, and that'll show you how those little how that little design is made. After all the talk about it, I had better show it to you clearly. All right, <laughs> good. Um, let me get up to that blue one and show you about the, uh, and talk about the way that shadow from the bottle uh, falls on the blue one. The blue one, I suppose, is nothing more than a base of white, a touch of, a touch of, I believe that, I, that, uh, that um, yes, I, the, the ultramarine blue, not the other ones. I have, um, I have, um, a uh, cobalt and manganese blue, but I believe that the basic of this basic color of this is going to be the um, the uh, ultramarine. Uh, this is, of course, all the trained eye. I suppose that I would know that it's ultramarine. I think that maybe if I had a class, we would have to go into the business of what makes ultramarine blue different from the other tones. Uh, but I won't do that now. We don't have the time. All right, here is this extremely dark shadow that is. Um, uh, Running across the uh, the uh, the left side of this Christmas ball, because uh, incomprehensibly enough, it's coming from the bottle. This has all got to do with the placement of the lights, and I think that it'll make some sense when I when I finally get it done. In the meantime, I'm using almost pure ultramarine with a touch of of um, raw umber to get it really dark and it, the, the shadow runs into the rest of it. So for the most part, this blue ornament over here is, is uh, actually, most of it is dark. And uh, the, um, the highlight is what tells you what it is. So the darkness comes down here. And uh, I hope that, uh, that uh, you are interested in these because, uh, as I say, when I was searching around for what to do, uh, I knew that there were some pale pink ones, but I had never seen this selection of colors uh, that I found here. So uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that they're as interesting to you as they were to me. Here is the, here's the blend that's going to take place going from extremely dark to extremely light very suddenly. Uh, let me see if that's, well, it's not quite right. Let me, let me try to get that even darker here because the, um, the darkness uh, becomes, uh, the, the highlight becomes, uh, comes along quite suddenly. Um, maybe, maybe the, uh, the, uh, the introduction of these ornaments is going to tell you something about how you would go about painting other round and shiny, uh, shiny objects. 
Obviously, the brilliance of these colors is not on everything. This is made for a particular season and has a particular point in mind, the brilliance of these, of these ornaments. But the basic uh, problem of painting round objects is all right here in this subject matter. Uh, the, uh, the blending, of course, has got to do with painting portraits. When you paint portraits, you have to be able to blend uh, the features of the human face uh, extremely subtly, as, as subtly as you would have to blend this. So all of these lessons uh, uh, have, their, have their practical side, too. The, everything that you find out when you're doing something like this has other uh, benefits mm, and you will find the same problems occur occurring with other subject matters such as portraiture and, uh, and uh, vegetables or, or, or anything else that is round and shiny. Here's that highlight up here against the crown and I do believe that that seems to be shining rather well but there's a reflected light so let me get that reflected light it's coming from the fabric and I believe that you will find that it's coming right over here, yes, there is a reflected tone right over here. It's quite subtle. It's small. It's, it's, it's not much, but it is nevertheless there. And once again, I'm, my job in life is to point out to you what I see and what happens when I see it. The, um, the, I hope that the TV uh, can pick it up because it is quite subtle, but I do believe that it has probably picked up an awful lot of it. So the crown on top of that is once again a small brush and the use of the, um, of the pale tone up here on the on the little on the little um, the little sort of uh, well teeth like things that form this and then the darkness at the top there's one dark one over here and the darkness of the top which makes it um, credible it you you and you believe and understand what you see when you put these on until that time until I put these on they were nothing but uh, shiny round uh, spheres now they have turned into what they're supposed to be namely these Christmas balls. Um, here are the little separations of the of the teeth, and they don't have to be uh, they don't have to be uh, done in a, in an anatomical way, just an indication. And the the uh, the wire this time is now dark because it's against a pale background. So the darkness uh, the darkness of the wire is not no longer uh, no longer pale. It is it's it's black, well blackish with a little highlight on it. So why don't we just put a highlight on that little wire just for fun, just to see whether or not we can really fool the eye. We have a, I have a highlight on this little wire. Okay, let's, okay. There we are. Highlight on the wire, very silly, but it works. All right, uh, if, if time is running out, I think that I should probably tackle we're going to break. Well, uh, you, we've gotten, uh, we've, I, I, th I think that maybe it's a good idea to break now for just a, se a second. I have something that I must do, namely get a very clean brush. I'll be right back. After that short break and to continue with our composition for a seasonal subject matter and namely these wonderful uh, these wonderful strange and pastel colored Christmas ornaments um, I talked a little bit about putting a background we have a plain background here in the studio and I'm thinking that now I would like to introduce the possibility of thinking about a different background than what we have there so <clears throat> let me uh, let me uh, let me put in uh, a paler tone, and then from there maybe work in some some kind of an uh, of a fantasy. Seeing as how this is the winter time, we have not yet 
as, as of this hour seen any snow which is what everybody expects and of course the nature uh, being tricky uh, does not accommodate when we expect things and so holds off but being a painter and having the ability to create something uh, in, in, a, in a picture, maybe I can introduce the idea of having snow as a background for this particular uh, painting. Uh, there is no reason why we can't. I have done it a number of times because sometimes compositions do not, do not exactly work the way you plan them and they need something extra. And I'm, not, I'm not necessarily saying that this is not working except that um, it's a good opportunity to, to, to put a new, a new um, and you look on the uh, on the uh, on the piece instead of just a still life. It's always it's always fun to say, well, that wasn't really there. Uh, but this is what you can do when you decide to improvise. Improv imp improvisation, of course, is very interesting to me because I'm I live with a family of musicians, and improvisation is uh, one of the mainstays of being a musician to improvise. Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to kind of suggest that because this is uh, this is the Long Island, we could step away from that and go off into off into an area which has uh, bumps in its landscape, namely mountains. So I'm going to just suggest here a uh, a mountain area. I don't think I want it breaking at this point. I think I'd like to have it breaking a little bit higher because breaking it at that point is going to make it look as though it is um, uh, as though it's part of the design. So I'm going to break it instead of instead of on the uh, instead of on the shoulder I'm going to go to the middle of the shoulder so I've now I've now brought in the possibility of some distant land a distant place uh, and that's not a bad idea because the little uh, the little um, bottle here has a kind of an oriental look about it and that means that you could in fact maybe even say that we are going to do a scene that that suggests the orient um, I like the oriental uh, approach to landscape paintings. It's extremely simple and it's very direct and uh, I have been, I've been a fan of, of, of the, uh, the Japanese uh, landscapes for most of my painting life. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese have mastered it in my opinion uh, as far as landscape painting is concerned. The others are fine but, uh, but for me the appeal in the Japanese is the, is the wonderful space and the incredible amount of simplicity which, uh, which uh, you, you can find in, in just about any uh, quality Japanese print. I'm not talking about airport souvenirs. I'm talking about quality uh, Japanese prints that most of the time are in museums but many times are available um, in, uh, in good uh, uh, shops. Now, see, uh, the, the, the mistake, of, not the mistake, but the, the problem the one encounters here is that I have to paint around this subject matter, something that I try to avoid doing because, first of all, it's, it's time consuming, and secondly, it's not necessary. But I've changed the attitude about this particular still life by deciding to put it in a, in a different environment. And so uh, that is how, um, uh, let me change brushes so that I can get that in, in there because if I don't get it in there properly, that brush was dirty, that's why I threw it down so fast. Here's a cleaner one. Remember, clean brushes are essential. Here is my little, uh, the little wire which we took so much tr trouble to do, and that is now going to just be, um, just be dark against this very pale background. Um, it should be absolutely round, and so if it's lost its roundness, it has to be put back in, maybe at a later date. But what we're trying to do now is to, is to. Um, is to complete this uh, with the clock, of course, ticking away like some the jaws of a great wolf. Uh, always behind me are the uh, are the minutes sounding sounding their departure from this program. I never have enough time, but that's the complaint usually with most of these programs that nobody has the time to do it. Now, all right, I'm as long as I can as long as I can just carry through to the edge here. I'm going to thin it with some turpentine. That makes it that'll make it spread more quickly and also maybe give it an interesting texture. Um, the, uh, the cloth, the velvet cloth, which I was complaining so much about, could in fact be considered part uh, maybe of a mountain uh, because it has those shapes. And um, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to just uh, continue one of these lines over on the left side of the picture and just continue it as the, as the mountain range. Let me just continue it and go over here, end it here. That gives you the illusion that this is in fact a mountain. So it could be a velvet mountain. And we're now dealing, we're now going into something that Mr. Dali, uh, Salvatore Dali did for all of his life, which was surrealism. Ma namely, that there are no rules to, any, to it. You can improvise and build as you go along. 
So, let's say that <coughs> here, through this whole process, I have come up with a, well, maybe it's an oriental uh, uh, scene in the distance, and p possibly now I can put in a, uh, a very dramatic dark, uh, a dark sky, and that can then, in fact, uh, house something, uh, some, some, some lovely design, either a moon or stars or snow, one or the other. But uh, the, um, as long as I am treading on this extremely fertile and dangerous territory, namely creating surrealism in front of your eyes, uh, I'm going to try to make it work. Now, the, my, I'm going to be losing my little uh, pagoda-shaped top unless I put a highlight on it. And that is done probably with, uh, with one brush stroke of white on the top of that little pagoda there to show you that it has not lost it. Let me do that right now, presume, assuming that there is going to be some light falling on that. Uh, and then maybe I can, in fact, blend it so that it, will, so that it does not look made up. There we are. Let me just g give it a little bit of blending here. So that has now isolated the, uh, the, um, the little pagoda top. And I'm going to continue here with the darkness to show you uh, that the drama of dark and light is, um, is essential in painting of just about any kind. You would, you would always pay attention to how dramatic a story you couldn't tell with your compositions. And drama, of course, is, is, is accomplished in many, many ways. One of the most effective uh, ways to do it is with color. There are um, the, uh, the, uh, the reason that some of the great paintings of the world are remembered is because of the drama in the color. I believe that the painting, the first uh, painting that ever sold for over a million dollars was Rembrandt's uh, Aristotle uh, uh, contemplating the bust of somebody or other uh, at the Metropolitan sold for a million and a half dollars way, way back, 25 or 30 years ago. And the, the, the dr drama of it is the color scheme. The, it is extremely dark with a, a brilliant, um, brilliant uh, shots here and there of copper tones and so on. And it's, like, cool, it's a wonderful piece, of course, it's an extraordinary painting. But the, the, it's a good illustration to show you the drama that color can give. And uh, if you have to invent it when a painting is done and you find that you don't have enough, uh, what you might call punch, I think is what, the, is what the, uh, the advertising men would call it. It doesn't have enough punch. You can add the punch. And I have a feeling that uh, substituting this plain gray background that we started off with uh, with a more punchy um, uh, background is probably a good idea. And then, uh, because it's seasonal, let me just um, fall for a cliché, let me do a cliché, and give you some stars. And they can be extremely subtle, they can be almost, maybe not even, maybe not even perceptible. And the fact that I'm putting it on a, um, on a freshly covered uh, background means that it's picking up the blue, which make it, is making them even more subtle. And these, uh, this is this is what you call a design uh, a, a design uh, device to uh, to make an, an interesting uh, painting, which otherwise uh, maybe didn't need it. But I think that it's an interesting way of being able to talk about how you can uh, change things as you go along. Um, I, the uh, I don't always advocate changing things as you go along, but this is a fantasy piece. And it might just as well go all the way and be totally fanciful. I'm going to blend, blend some of that back there because this looks a little bit cartoony. And if I blend it and make the, the, uh, make the distance or the, what presumably is passing for uh, snow-covered mountains, make them a little bit more subtle and not quite so, uh, not, not, not quite so uh, department store packaging. Um, I, I hope that my terms are not, are, which are very private and very, very personal terms, don't confuse you. But anyway, here is the, here is the general feeling about uh, to give a seasonal uh, uh, flavor to this particular painting. There are two other ones, uh, other two other uh, ornaments to paint, and um, um, might just as well go to it as long as we, uh, extraordinarily enough, have the time. I can barely believe that we would have the time to accomplish almost all of it. I would like to be able to get the other apricot colored one in. Maybe I can. And there is a crown missing here and there. This little crown on the pink one here is missing. But um, here, here we go once again with the extremely dark tone of this 
pastel colored Christmas ornament. Very interesting, <coughs> pardon me, observation about how you get uh, shi shiny things shiny by making the dark areas extremely dark. Uh, so here we have the the, the um, I'm going to I'm going to put a little bit of blue in here because I discover that because I don't know why it is but there is a kind of a bluish green tone here at the top and uh, uh, th th that's what happens when you work from life you discover things which you did not other see other see otherwise and. Uh, that I have claimed for an awfully long time that it is easier to work from life than it is to invent because all the information is right there for you. I am um, I'm going to uh, be able to uh, return uh, the uh, this painting to some sort of form of of uh, a true frameable painting when I uh, when I refine it when I talk about refining I mean it may look perfectly all right as it is but after you refine it it looks even better and uh, there is no way of ever saying that this painting is 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 finished it is finished as far as the instructional part of it is concerned but when we do have our sale of these television paintings and it is understood that many of them, or most of them, have been refined and reworked uh, simply because the uh, the time element is so is so pressing here. There is another highlight just about there before that little crown takes place, and then I have a I believe there's another reflection, sort of a reflected area here, very subtle, but f uh, very much paler. Um, I am, I am reasonably sure that uh, there will be the same amount of uh, paintings for sale at the, uh, at the April event, which is what we did last year, and this one will of course be among it, uh, because it could just become a Christmas ornament in the house and you, you simply hang it at Christmas time. Um, I ho I'm, I'm hoping also to be able to uh, bring some new format uh, uh, programs uh, next year by having um, uh, introducing and beginning to talk uh, about watercolor. Uh, too many people ask me about watercolor. How come you don't do watercolor? Well, watercolor is not done at an easel. You must have a flat table uh, surface on which to work with watercolor for the very simple uh, gravity reasons is that water flows and uh, you you must be able to have your uh, your paint your your painting surface flat which means a new angle for the camera and so we're going to be working that out and seeing whether or not I can in fact begin to in, to, 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 to talk about a watercolor painting and give some instructions it's a it's a technical problem and we're going to uh, we're going to see if we can manage it um, I, I, do, I do watercolor in the classic way. I do it uh, by uh, by working on wet paper, and all of that is is going to be part of the um, of the new plan for how to uh, for, for some new programs. Uh, we're going to, of course, be continuing to do the ones that we do here with the monitors as our source material for landscape painting, but also um, to certainly not um, completely ignore the uh, wonderful. Uh, world of watercolor painting that is uh, that is absolutely essential that we that we start to tackle that well as you can see i'm sort of coming towards the end of this still sitting here diligently observing my little uh, areas uh, of color uh, hoping that you have have gotten something out of this uh, usually i find that the um the uh the painting of a, of, a, of, a, of one of these one hour programs without any phone call interruptions makes me talk a great deal and I'm hoping that what I say is of some use and maybe if not of any use maybe it's just plain entertaining well thanks for watching this is um, uh, the the seasonal painting of the year um, see you next time this is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel bye bye <laughs>